Well, thanks. Thanks for having me here, Ida. And thanks everyone for coming and, and listening. Uh, my name is Tony Thorpe, and I'm a coordinator, coordinator of the Lakes of Missouri Volunteer Program. I see at least one uh, volunteer in the uh, in the uh, audience. So hi, Julie. And uh, with that, I'm going to start my talk. If I can work digital things. Um, so part of a good talk, I've been told, is to have an agenda at the beginning so that people know when uh, the meetings or the uh, presentation is mercifully nearly ended. Um, my agenda is very short and informal. I'm going to talk about some interesting weird critters in our in our waters and then I'll talk about the LNDP and then I'll wrap up and be done. So with that, um, I should have put a uh, preamble at the beginning of that because first I need to make a uh, disclaimer. Uh, I'm coordinator of the Lakes of Missouri Volunteer Program, but technically we really don't have a lot of lakes in Missouri. What we have are reservoirs which are dammed streams, more or less. Sometimes we have, have ponds where they pump water into a hole um, or catch water off the landscape. But for, by and large, the water bodies we're most familiar with are reservoirs. Um, we make these by damming streams and they really alter the river systems. And a lot of the organisms that I'll be talking about today are challenged by the creation of dams. Um, we put these on our landscape though, because there are, is a need for water um, for humans. Um, so we have to balance human needs versus ecology. So uh, drinking water is a really common reason, especially in Northern Missouri. Uh, flood control, again, especially in, in Northern Missouri. Um, hydroelectric power, more common down South in Missouri. And we have recreational needs that need to be met. Um, people need to have a place to go and play on the water. Um, also, before I jump in here, again, more digital management, just a second here. Um, I want to talk about lake zones, like areas in the within the lake, uh, before I get too deep into this. Uh, in the summer, the, our lakes are stratified, meaning there's warmer water at the top and cooler water at the bottom. And if you've ever jumped in um, a lake off a dock or something and plunged down, you felt the cold water near the bottom. That's the thermocline. Let me move my mouse and see if you can see the thermocline here or the hypolimnion. And these are the cooler waters as opposed to this warmer water on the top. And a lot of the life that I'll be talking about in lakes anyway will be residing in this uh, upper area because this bottom layer, this hypolimnion in Missouri, typically has no oxygen during the summer. So one of the first things I'll talk about here are algae. And what are algae that well, they, they come in lots of different shapes and sizes, um, but they're generally considered to be like plants. They photosynthesize, take energy from the sun to make um, simple sugars. Um, and uh, they can be tiny single-celled organisms. They can be giant, uh, giant, like 100 feet long. You think of kelp in the ocean. So those are actually algae. Um, interestingly, a lot of algae are symbiotic with other organisms like uh, Lichens are actually fungi with uh, with a uh, symbiotic algae. There's some mollusks. There's even a vertebrate, which I'll talk about here in a little while, um, that has a symbiotic algae within its body. So again, we're talking about this sort of top layer. Algae, uh, some of them can swim a little bit, but uh, they tend to be stuck in this epilimnion at the surface. They're currents that, that swirl around um, bringing the algae up into the light and down and then up back into the light. If the algae sink below the thermocline, uh, the density difference is usually so great that they can't swim back up. And so once they're down there, they're stuck and they sink to the bottom and, and die. So with that sort of uh, very basic introduction, we're going to start talking about some weird critters because uh, these are neat. Um, the first one, I'm going to start small and kind of work my way large. Um, I'll talk about the tardigrades. And these are the water bears. These are microscopic. Well, they're, you can see them with your naked eye, but they're pretty small, about the, uh, about not quite as long as a dime is thick. Um, they eat plants and algae and, and other small, small, small invertebrates. And you can, you can find these just about anywhere, anywhere there's water. Uh, about 900 species in the world. Uh, they date back to the Cambrian period, 500 million years ago. Um, and normally they live 
you know, a month or two, uh, maybe a couple of years. But they have this neat thing where they form what's called a ton. And they basically reduce their volume and slow their metabolism down. And scientists are, have been fascinated with these things and really seem to be trying to figure out what it is that makes this, this uh, process tick. So they, they try to kill these things. Um, and they found that they can survive being frozen in liquid nitrogen. Uh, they can survive boiling water for fairly short periods of time. Um, they can survive radiation and they can even survive being in outer space. They've sent them up in satellites and uh, in uh, spacecraft and, and come back down. And in fact, a couple of years ago, an, an Israeli lunar lander had an experiment involving tardigrades crash on the moon. So if you're a science fiction uh, or fantasy buff, the notion of these nearly indestructible life forms stranded on the moon in stasis uh, is kind of fascinating. So we have these things everywhere, but anyway, that's starting small tardigrades. Uh, moving up a little larger, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with zooplankton, but they're small creatures, largely uh, crustaceans. They're not all crustaceans, but largely they're crustaceans, like like shrimp and lobsters are crustaceans. Uh, but these are these are tiny. Um, if you were to go out to a pond, scoop up a glass of water, and hold it up to the light, you could see them sort of darting around. They're, they move this kind of short jerky burst and uh, they eat algae. And the way they do that is they create, well, we'll take this uh, cladocerin here, the big picture, this is a, a daphnia. They create a current that sort of brings the water toward them. And then they catch the, uh, catch algae out of the water with these, uh, with these rakers up front and direct it to the mouth parts. Uh, in this case, this, this Daphnia here has uh, eggs in her back. You can see those balls. Um, but there are several different kinds of zooplankton, and lots of different kinds um, and species within those, those groups. And they are really important. They're sort of the, uh, they're the functional link between algae that photosynthesize and pull, use the sun's energy to create carbohydrates. The uh, zooplankton, eat those and then eat those the algae and then transfer those nutrients up the food chain. So in this simple food chain, I've got this food web I've got here in this image, um, the, the small fish eat the zooplankton and then bigger fish eat the zooplankton or eat the uh, smaller fish rather, sorry. So they're an important link between uh, algae and the rest of the organisms. Here, next I'm gonna talk about freshwater jellyfish. Uh, these are interesting. I saw some last fall. You'll typically see them in the fall, um, but I, this is in Colombia. Um, you can, they're indigenous to China, so they're not really from around here, but they've been in the U.S. for almost a couple hundred years, since 1865 or so. Um, longer than any Missouri lake that I can think of has been here. So they've been in Missouri longer than our lakes. Uh, they have two life stages. They start out as a polyp, which is a little sessile, I mean, attached um, stage. It looks kind of like a hydra, um, a small stalk, and then tentacles at the top. Uh, but then when it's time to reproduce, they turn loose and they'll swim around. And you can, uh, you'll can you see them often in groups, large groups. And, uh, oh yeah, here. So I've got some uh, videos. Chris Barnhart at Missouri State has done a lot of uh, interesting shots and I'll have some of his, uh, his images and videos, but here's just a, I'm gonna turn that volume down, sorry. But just a neat, you can see this thing swimming around. It's, uh, I, the ones I've seen have been about a dime size or smaller, but reportedly they can get as big as about a quarter. And they are harmless to humans and they can sting, but I don't know that a human could ever feel it. I have played with them and haven't felt a thing. And let me see if I can advance this. All right, so I'm starting to get a little bigger now with uh, weird invertebrates. This is a bryozoan colony. So bryozoans, also called moss animals, are small. They look kind of like a hydra individually. They're a little stalk with uh, feeding, feeding apparatus at, at the end. Uh, but uh, when a... Uh, 
polyp attaches to something, it can reproduce asexually by budding and it just sort of divides and divides and divides. And eventually you get these balls of mass. Um, uh, they're soft and, they're, well, they're firm, but they're kind of squishy. Um, if you've ever seen those things, that, those dinosaurs you get at the grocery store, you put them in water and they grow to 10 times their normal size. Uh, it, they feel like that kind of firm, but like firm, they're dense throughout, but they're squishy at the surface. Um, and they're really, really fascinating. Um, they tend to wash up on our shores of our lakes uh, in the winter when it gets cold, they start to die and they detach. Um, here's a picture from Missouri. Um, you can see, this is how you'll see them from the water's surface. And they'll often attach to sticks and things. And in fact, if you take a kayak or a boat out to Little Dixie, in the summer, you can often see these on the brush piles that they stack in the water off the dam uh, for fishermen. Uh, they, they, they're fish attractors that you know, fish hide on the sticks and things. Uh, but if you paddle over them and look down, you can often see these attached at Little Dixie Lake. Uh, starting to get a little bigger now with the individual organism anyway, um, dragonfly nymphs. So a lot of people don't realize, and I'm, it, I was, quite old before I realized that dragonflies aren't born flying. They, a typical dragonfly may live a few years, but nearly all of that time will be spent in the water. And in this stage, they, uh, they crawl around in the water. Like I got another slide, but they, they, they'll crawl around in the water for several years, a um, year or two, three, and, and then climb out and then finally emerge um, from there from their shell and then fly away and then live for about a month or so in that uh, flying stage. Whoops. They, uh, they're voracious predators and they will crawl around and eat anything. I think I've heard stories of them eating fish. They have gills inside their rectum and they breathe apparently by drawing water in and squirting it out of their butt. Um, and if there's a predator or something that wants to eat them and they, uh, they need to flee, they can squirt water very quickly out and shoot, um, shoot to safety. And uh, one of the neat things about these visually is they have extensible jaws. So their lower jaw can reach out and grab prey. And fortunately, somebody uh, put a video of it online. I'm going to turn the volume down here and just talk over this. Uh, so a neat thing you can do is if you're at a stream or a lake and you see a dragonfly nymph, um, you can catch it and keep it in a small aquarium, uh, make sure it's got oxygen in the water, um, and you can feed them. You can, you can collect uh, small bugs out of, the, out of a creek and put them in there. You can watch them eat like this, and it's really fascinating. They just reach out and grab it, and, it, and so in this case, it's eating mosquito larvae. But it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really fascinating. Let me see if I can, what happens when I click here? Well, so digital things, sorry. There we go. Uh, kind of moving through the uh, invertebrates, uh, the water scorpions, they, these are bugs, true bugs, hemipterans, and they can get to be about four inches or so long, and they sort of crawl around on the uh, in the plants and, and in the substrate and pierce other bugs or invertebrates with their beak and they stab it with the uh, they have like a straw like mouth part um, and and like spiders they inject uh, digestive fluids and in, into their prey and then then suck the uh, basically drink them like a straw so now moving along here one of my favorites are mussels and in Missouri, we have a lot of mussels. I'll talk about that in a second, but first I wanna give props to the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, they have lots of publications like this one, Missouri's Freshwater Mussels. Uh, it's a, like a 12 page pamphlet and that they used to give out free and they may still do that. You can go to the, uh, the uh, regional office and see, you might wanna call first in the age of COVID, but uh, they often have pamphlets like these sitting around you can just pick them up and then you know, stick them in your pocket and take them with you when you go out, out walking through the uh, through our streams. Um, they also have a lot of great books. I've got several on my shelf, and you can probably check them out at the library. Um, 
but we have 69 species of mussels in Missouri and they range from really tiny to up to like eight inches long. And uh, one of the, the great things, I don't know how it happened. Like them, I just can imagine somebody with a funny hat and naming these things, um, but they have heel splitter, pistol grip, monkey face, pimple back, warty back. They have, they just have such great colorful names. Um, but the reason that I put them in here is their interesting reproduction cycle. And this is another thing that I learned way too late in life. I wish as if I'd learned this as a child, I would have been probably gone into studying mussels. But uh, some species of mussels, well, let me back up here. They reproduce by the males will, will just let their sperm loose in the water and the females will, will filter. I'm, if you see my little picture, I'm, <laughs> I'm filter feeding. Um, I'm filtering in the sperm and then fertilize the eggs. And then when the eggs have developed and it's time to let them out into the world, uh, the, the small muscles, the glochidia they're called, cannot survive on their own. They need a host and that host is fish. And so in order to get the fish close enough to the muscle so that the muscle can, can deliver its young, so many mussels create this lure. And in this case, this looks like a little fish. And what happens is the, the fish will come up and bite at this lure. And then the female releases the glochidia. And let's just go to a video. I've, got a, I've stuck a few videos in here, not too many, but uh, some of this stuff is just much easier to see in motion. So here we're gonna see some small bass uh, getting, uh, getting their glochidia. And so there's the bass thinking it's eating food and surprised that it has nothing in its mouth. And you see the glochidia coming through the gills. And then here's, a, I don't know how they got the shot, but you see them clamping onto the gills inside the fish. So that then, so these, they're a parasite on the fish and they live on the gills for a period of time and they don't seem to harm the fish. And then after a period of time, they will drop off and develop. And they also, thanks to having, uh, let me see some, you can see what kind of weird things I watch on YouTube. You can, thanks to the, uh, thanks to the fish, now they're also being dispersed around to other parts of the, uh, of the stream. We do have a couple of mussels in Missouri that are invasive. Uh, one of the frustrating things about these is they don't need a host and they are incredibly prolific reproducers. And so they can take over water bodies um, pretty quickly. We have them in a few of our Missouri lakes, uh, the zebra mussel in particular, you've probably heard about. Um, and it's really easy to move these from one body of water to the next. So if you're out there in your boat or even your kayak or paddling around, anything that's touched the water has to be disinfected before moving it to another body of water. Another cool organism in Missouri are the hellbenders. These are aquatic salamanders. They can get up to be uh, 20 inches long. We have two species in Missouri. Um, and they, they breathe through their skin and they primarily eat crayfish. They can live for 35 years or so, but uh, the oldest one that I found in my research that it was in captivity and it lived to be 55 years old. So these are, these are amazing. In China, there's a giant salamander that can actually get to almost six feet long and like 140 pounds, I think. So I, you can imagine a salamander that big. Uh, it's just fascinating. But these can be a few pounds and they are, uh, they're right here in Missouri. They're not doing great. The St. Louis Zoo has a program where they're breeding them, uh, trying to release them back to captivity. And I believe they have managed to release some into captivity, captivity by now, but it's been years they've been working on this. Uh, here's another shot of a hellbender walking around. Uh, you'll typically, if, well, if you're going to find these, you're going to find these uh, more in the Ozarks than in our area. And I've got a short video here just so you can see how they move around in the water because it's, uh, it's fascinating. They're graceful. They look like they'd be clumsy and hideous, but they're it's gorgeous. Oops, get rid of the ad. Let's 
They're just fascinating. And so with that, I'll start talking about some of the more common things and things you might see around town here. Um, oh, there'll be other weird things too, but uh, this is the long ear sunfish. And these things are gorgeous. The males develop these really bright colors uh, during, well, right about now. I was at uh, Hinkson the other day, Hinkson Creek, and saw some long ear sunfish in their breeding colors. And uh, yeah, they're just gorgeous fish. Missouri is also home to several, many, not just several, many darter species. Uh, very colorful fish, and these are breeding colors here. But I mean, these would be at home in any tropical tropical aquarium, except that they're very hard to keep alive in an aquarium. I, I think I've tried, haven't been successful. Um, there's a rainbow darter, and then we have. Uh, in Missouri, we have the Niangua darter, which is a threatened species. A lot of research and work has gone into protecting these. Again, the Missouri Department of Conservation is doing a lot of great work. Also in Missouri, we have paddlefish. And these typically like the big rivers. Um, they can get to be five or six feet long and, or, or bigger, but uh, that's kind of a typical length. They uh, they are Missouri's official aquatic animal, in case you need to know. They don't have bones or teeth. They're cartilaginous fish, and they're prized for their, their eggs, their roe. And so there is a rule that you cannot sell wild harvested paddlefish eggs, at least in Missouri. But if they are privately owned fish, you can. And so a few years back, there was a company that was contacting landowners and you know, lake owners to release these into their lakes. And then a few years later, they'd come back and collect them, harvest them, and then uh, harvest the row. And then the landowner would, or lake owner would get uh, some money. I think that company has gone under. So now a lot of our small lakes have paddlefish in them, uh, but they're filter feeders. They eat zooplankton, those tiny crustaceans that we talked about earlier. Um, you can see the top left picture there is a paddlefish swimming and and filters with the uh, the gill rakers there on the in, on the side of his head uh just filters out zooplankton they also can jump which is kind of disturbing if you're not expecting it uh it sounds like somebody like threw a bowling ball in the lake and you imagine a six foot fish jumping uh it's it's pretty uh it's pretty impressive <laughs> At Lake of the Ozarks Lake of the Ozarks uh, in the summer, doing water sampling, and you can hear these big kabooms, and it's these fish just flopping around. So, another group of fish we have, unfortunately, in Missouri, are these Asian carp species, and there are there are several. Uh, the they're non-native. They can be four feet long, but ironically, they are in the minnow family. They're common in the big rivers. You've probably heard about these in news or seen videos on YouTube. Uh, they compete with paddlefish for food, and they're also, they compete with other fish for food, other species for food. So they're pushing out other species of fish. Grass carp are frequently stocked by the Department of Conservation and they're into ponds and lakes to control aquatic vegetation. A lot of people don't like to fish. If there's a lot of plants ringing the shoreline, they can't reel in their lines. And so they put in grass carp to control the plants, which is great for the people fishing from shore, but it does have a negative effect on water quality when these grass carp rummage around the bottom of the lake and stir up the mud. They eat the plants that would otherwise hold the sediments down on the bottom. So I'm not a big fan of grass carp, but they're an effective tool for, for some lake people, I suppose. The ones that NBC stocks are altered so that they're triploid and they are unable to reproduce, but there are some in the big rivers that are not altered. I don't know how they got there from other, other uh, private owners. Also there are the silver carp, which are the ones that jump. And you may have seen this or heard about this, but here's a, a video, or I'm sorry, it's just a picture. 
but they're often agitated by the motor noises. So if you're on the big river, you're motoring around. And if you happen to go by a bunch of these, they just erupt. I was on a uh, an oxbow that had water recently flooded. And so the river water had gotten into this oxbow lake. And I just had a trolling motor in a canoe doing some water sampling. And three or four of these kept popping up around us. And it, it was it was terrifying. They, uh, these fish can get up to be like 40 pounds or so, 45 pounds. And there have been injuries reported. And I think even a death, I think it was a heart attack, but there may have been others. I don't know. So it's, it's, it's terrifying to think of these things jumping. But humans being weird creatures, we have adapted. And these weird sports have evolved uh, to hunt the fish. I think it was, since nobody really wants these in our rivers, it's, it, I guess it was deemed okay. But uh, don't do this. Don't water ski with a pitchfork. Just if you have any children nearby, tell them don't water ski with a pitchfork. Missouri is home to uh, gar. We have four species. The alligator gar can get up to like 10 feet long, but typically they're going to be just a couple of feet long. They're armored fish, really bony and really tough, thick hide. They have lots of teeth in their long mouth and they're ambush predators. So they often will just sort of lay in wait for something to go by and they'll, they'll dart at it. They can, they're capable of swimming very fast for very short distances um, and they will uh, they'll grab prey and they have really pointy teeth. We'll see that in a second. You see these in the Hinkson Creek all the time. If you're ever walking on the, uh, the trails, MKT or any of the other numerous trails we have around here and you happen to take a bridge over Hinkson Creek, just stop and look down. And if you wait long enough and the water is not roll, uh, running too fast, I pretty much guarantee you you're going to see some gar. Um, look around the edges for the surface. You can see in this picture, the tail just sort of breaks the surface. That's pretty common. You'll see the tail swish around a little bit and just watch and they'll, they'll swim under you. So here's an, a teeth of an alligator gar. You can see they're, they're very pointy. This is an MDC photo. And the alligator gar are, are, I don't know the exact status if it's threatened, but their, their numbers are declining significantly. And so MDC was, they had a program for uh, returning some alligator gar to the wild. Here's another, I think that's a long nose gar, but just to highlight the, the pointy teeth. I have been fishing in the creeks, um, wading, and I have never been bitten by them, but I've had them swim pretty much between my legs as I'm waiting. Um, it, it's startling, but I'm never scared of the fish. I'm just scared of the startle. Uh, similarly, potentially scary in the water are snapping turtles. On the left is a picture of a turtle in the road, and that's, that's where we often see snapping turtles, uh, unfortunately, is crossing the road, moving from one body of water to the next. Uh, but the picture on the right is their more natural habitat, you know, sunning on a log. I have the snapping turtles in here primarily because of this feature of the alligator snappers. Like the mussels, they also have a lure. And I mean, that is two words, a lure. They, they have a lure to some, but uh, they have a lure on the tip of their tongue that they can waggle around. And so they'll sit at the, in the water with their mouth open and waggle this lure and a fish will come and investigate to eat it and then become food itself. And so there's no, nothing being eaten in this video, but I have a video of this. But again, it's just, it's just fascinating, the diversity of organisms in our, in our waters here in Missouri. So it just lays there and wiggles that tongue. That's, so with that, uh, that's apparently that's the end of my uh, organisms. I've got a few more in here, but I'm going to talk now a little bit about the Lakes of Missouri Volunteer Program. And so we're a water quality monitoring group that monitors on Missouri's lakes. We enlist the help of citizen scientists, volunteers to do the, all the legwork, all the field work, and they collect the water samples 
and uh, we do the analyses at our lab at the University of Missouri. Uh, we were founded in 1992, so we, we're coming up on our 30th year here soon. Is that right? I'm doing math. Yes, that's right. The, uh, we have 65 lakes in the program, typically about 120 sites. And we have more sites than lakes because at places like Table Rock, Lake of the Ozarks, Stockton, Tanning Como, uh, we may have multiple monitoring sites because those are such large lakes. Uh, we have our volunteers monitor eight times in a season. They go out, collect their water sample. It doesn't take a whole lot of time, but they collect their water samples, make some observations, and take some measurements, paddle back or motor back, and then process the samples at their laboratories, typically in their homes. And then, uh, excuse me, they uh, sit on the samples in their freezers. It's, they just hang on to them. And then twice a year, I drive around the state and pick them up, bring them back to our lab. And we, we do all the analyses at the lab in, in Columbia here at the university. So what we end up with are really high quality data because the analyses are done in our lab using the same methods and by the same analysts that we use for our research projects. And so it's, we have great, amazing water quality data that the, uh, the DNR uses extensively. Some of the parameters we're looking at, water temperature, water clarity. We look at suspended sediment, sediment particles, mud in the water. We look at chlorophyll, which is a way of estimating the amount of algae in the water. We look at nutrients and cyanotoxins or algal toxins that, that uh, certain blue-green algae can produce. So talking about temperature, and these are the only, got a couple of graphs here, but hopefully it's not too miserable. But going back to our lake picture, we remember we had the warm epilimnion, and then as you descend down into the water, it becomes cooler. Well, we have this device up here, it's called a fish hawk, and it's meant for fishers to use people who fish. And you lower it into the water and it measures the temperature on the way down. And so here's one reading from, I believe this is Table Rock Lake. And at the surface, at this point, you can see the temperature is up at the top. It was 82 degrees or so. And then depth is here on the, on the side, on the left with zero at the top. So this is the lake surface and it's going down into the lake. You see the temperature drops a little bit. And then there's this rapid change here. And this is the thermocline. That's this part here in the middle. And then it, the temperature levels off and it's cool all the way to the bottom. And that's the hypolimnion. So the life we're looking at in the lakes is pretty much going to be up here at the, at the surface where there's oxygen because there's no oxygen down at the bottom in Missouri lakes in the summertime. So a neat thing is we can take a bunch of these graphs throughout a season and make a single graph. And so the one on the right, this is the last graph, I promise. The one on the right is just like the one on the left, except across the uh, horizontal axis, instead of temperature, it's time. And temperature is now shown as the color. And this here is from this previous graph is the beginning of the thermocline. And I've made a line here to show where that is throughout the season. So if you start these dots at the bottom here are each sampling date. If you move across, you can see where the thermocline was on any given day. Like this point in May, it was about 12 feet or so. In June, it had dropped to 23 feet in July. And then by the time you get later in the season, that it gets deeper and deeper until finally the lake mixes again. Um, it's the same temperature from top to bottom. So we're, that's one of the things we do with temperature in the lakes uh, in our program. We also look at water clarity. Now this is, uh, again, back to this, this image, we're trying to estimate the photic zone, the depth of the photic zone, how deep light can penetrate into the water. And so we've got this disc, it's about a nine inch round disc, uh, named after Father Angelo Pietro Secchi, who was a, a Vatican science advisor. And the story, which is probably much better than the truth, but the story is that he went uh, to the, uh, the, the galley on the, the research vessel and got a plate drilled a hole through it and use that to measure water clarity in the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Um, 
however, the, whatever the story is, the origin story, I'm, I like that one, so I'm sticking with it. And, but we've been using this since the 1840s uh, consistently in limnology, and it's been, it's been a great, easy tool for measuring water clarity. The important thing about the water clarity is people often equate water clarity with water quality. So if they see a lake that has clear water or a stream that has clear water, the assumption is that the water quality is good. And in most cases, that's true. So the things that can affect water clarity in Missouri are suspended sediment and algae, mostly. So hit these real quick. Suspended sediment, essentially mud in the water uh, in sun lands landscapes, like this agricultural landscape, you get plowed fields or land disturbance. It rains heavily, washes sediment down into the uh, into the lake. Same thing can happen in urban environments. You have construction, development, uh, any land disturbance, you get enough rain. And if the silt fence uh, has not been erected correctly, then you can have water with mud uh, rolling down into the streams. Another way, uh, another issue you can have a suspended sediment is not from it entering the waterway, but from disturbance in the waterway. So on the picture on the right, you see this well-developed area and imagine rainfall coming down out of the sky, trying to get into the earth. What happens is it hits a rooftop uh, or a street, runs into the gutter, eventually it runs down in, into a culvert pipe somewhere and shoots directly into the stream. And the problem is that you went from no water, a very low water flow to suddenly you've got a torrent of water going through and that will scour and erode the streams uh, downhill from places like this. Uh, another thing that can affect water clarity in Missouri is algae. And this is a horrible example. This actually was taken, I think, out of Bradford Farms or one of the uh, dairy lakes here in Columbia. And we've talked about algae before. There are a lot of different types. To, it's, there's an amazing variety of algae. Some of the photo micrographs of algae are, are really amazing. Uh, they're at the base of most aquatic East aquatic ecosystems. Um, oh yeah, I promised to talk, talk about this one. It's gonna be really quick, but the spotted salamander, not around here. I wish we had them here, but it's in uh, Eastern US, but actually has a symbiotic relationship with algae and has algae inside of its body. That fascinating implications, again, as a science fiction fantasy reader, thinking about humans or animals with plants <laughs> inside their body it's just fascinating and more speculation but the thought of uh, herbicides affecting not just the effect of herbicides on such an organism uh, could actually potentially kill the the algae inside their body it's a lot of speculation but fascinating to think about so algae are not just cool they can actually be a problem if you get too much, especially in drinking water reservoirs, you can have taste and odor problems. Uh, algae photosynthesize, meaning they, they take in sunlight and then during that process, they kick out oxygen, which is great for the organisms in the water. But in the evening, when the sun's gone, they're respiring. And so they're breaking down those, those sugars that they've, they've built up during photosynthesis. And for that, they need oxygen. So what happens is the oxygen goes up and down and up and down with each uh, light cycle. And that really stresses out organisms in the water, particularly fish. So we also measure nutrients. I'm going to hit that now. So nutrients, we, we measure nitrogen and phosphorus in our lakes with our with a volunteer group because nutrients make algae grow. And much in the same way that fertilizer makes grass grow, fertilizer in lakes also makes algae grow. So if you need bag of fertilizer you pick up is going to have those three numbers on it, the NPK ratio. So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So those first two numbers represent the percent of that nutrient in that bag. So 10% is nitrogen, 10% is phosphorus. And that really can kick off a lot of algae growth. We measure nitrogen and phosphorus in micrograms per liter or parts per billion. So it doesn't take a lot. It's, I think somebody did this and I'm going to botch it, but I think it's the equivalent of like nickel in a in an Olympic-sized swimming pool is one part per billion. 
so small amounts can really have an effect on algae growth. And one of the reasons we're so concerned with algae growth uh, among, among several, but one of them has gotten prominence lately is the notion of algal toxins. And so beginning in 2014, it really hit the mainstream when the city of Toledo could not drink water from Lake Erie because of a cyanotoxin or, or a cyanobacterial bloom. We call, we call blue-green algae cyanotoxin or cyan, wait a second, start over. We call cyanobacteria blue-green algae and they're not technically algae, but we lump them in there. So they uh, occur and they have blooms. We call them harmful algae, algal blooms. And the uh, city of Toledo had a problem recently. It's been Florida, the Ohio River, uh, in North Carolina. There were some, some dog deaths that made the news. I was in South Africa and there was a, a couple of hippos died uh, from cyanotoxin blooms and or cyanobacterial blooms cyanotoxins, sorry. Uh, so with our program, we've measured two of these. We measure microcystin and cylindrospermopsin. They're the two most common ones that, uh, that we find. And so getting to that, we, we use citizen scientists or community scientists to do the, the field work. And these are some of them, some of the pictures that I've, I've, uh, that I was able to pull out. Uh, we, we couldn't do them, do this monitoring without these people. It's, they cover a lot of ground. They don't have to drive back and forth largely to their, to their water bodies. They live nearby. If we want to go sample Table Rock, we're looking at four hours drive time each way. A lot of our volunteers just live right on the lake. They can just pop out to the dock, get the sample. So it saves us a lot of time and we ended up with really great quality data. And so yeah, thanks to all the volunteers that uh, do this. And I'm gonna wrap this up with one final animal um, for symmetry. So this isn't a Missouri example, but it's really a fascinating notion. Um, I'm using that word a lot, fascinating, but bears. So we went from water bears and now I'm gonna go to bears. So in, there was a paper about the effect of water quality of bears on water quality in Alaska. And they, what they found was that salmon from the Pacific, they fatten up in the ocean and then swim upstream to their, their native spawning habitat. And then as when they arrive there, they've got all these nutrients that they acquired from the ocean. They brought them up into these upper reaches of these Alaska streams. Bears grab the salmon, eat them, take what they want and leave the carcasses in the riparian zone, that vegetative strip near the water. And as the animals decay, they contribute nutrients to the soil around the uh, around the stream, and those additional nutrients allow for the growth of different kinds of plants. And so, in this case, aspen trees and other plants start to appear. One uh, neat effect of that is those aspen trees and other plants fall into the water and decay, contributing more nutrients, and they contribute habitat for the the salmon fry that are coming up the next year. So it's a place for them to refuge for them to hide from predators until they're ready to go out to the ocean and get fat. Additionally, having these, this extra vegetation along the shoreline brings in other animals, like in this instance, the moose. And so bears eating salmon alters the terrestrial ecology, the aquatic ecology. And it's just a neat example of the commonality between water quality in the landscape and the effect that individuals can have on the water and the effect that the water has on us as well. And so with that, I believe that's the end and I will uh, gladly take any questions. And if there were questions in the chat, I completely forgot to check. So I apologize, <laughs> but I'm happy to take any questions now. And I wanna preface that by saying, I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I don't know a lot about anything. So with that caveat, I'm happy to answer or attempt to answer any questions. I don't see anything in the chat now. I think I did ask one about what size a fish was and then you answered it. So I thought you saw oh. the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I was curious, uh, I don't know if anybody else has a, about two things myself. One is, uh, do you have any advice to us other than cleaning our kayaks between bodies of water? Like what can your average person do to make sure our, our water stays clean in Missouri? And uh, if anybody was interested in helping your program. Well, yeah, great questions. The, uh, yeah, the rinsing of the kayaks is primarily between waters, bodies of water that have uh, invasive species in them. And so we're talking about those mussels. There's a hydrilla, there's some aquatic plants that are also invasive. So just make sure everything is picked off your, off your boat if you're going from one water body to the next. If you can avoid it, don't fertilize your lawn or, or use too many pesticides. That stuff does get into the water. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not great. We, we don't want any additional algae. We, we don't want to uh, harm any, any of the animals in the waterways. A lot of those lawn pesticides are really toxic to aquatic organisms. They're very sensitive to that. Uh, so if you do use those, sometimes, sometimes you have to follow the directions and don't do it before the rain. Like many of those pesticides break down fairly quickly over time. So just don't do it before a rain. And it, if you want to join the program or you want to get involved, my email address is in the, uh, on the slide right there, tony at lmvp.org. Feel free to email me, even if you just have questions or neat pictures you want to send me in case I'm doing another, another one of these talks and you, you have something that... <laughs> Have a picture you want in there. I see a lot of thanks and compliments. Oh, okay. yeah, let me. I'm going to stop sharing so I can figure out where those are and see them, whether they are. Oh, thanks. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Anybody else have any questions real quick? If, well, if you do, you can type while I'm talking. Um, we'll, we'll <laughs> <Francis> <laughs> and Kat wanted to get the fish. <laughs> I enjoyed those videos. Yeah, there's some of that stuff you can't really uh, show with a picture, so. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Tony. That was really informative. I, I knew that there would be people interested in this. I appreciate you sharing the knowledge. And thank you to everybody who attended. Um, if you want to know about more programs we have coming up, you can check our website, DBRL, as in Daniel Boone Regional Library, dbrl.org. Or you can uh, get one of these at any of our buildings or our bookmobile. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say good night. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ida, for having, having me on. Everybody have a good evening. <laughs>